Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India to the viewers. I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science. And today, I will be discussing on the topic, International Relations as a Discipline, Emergence and Evolution. To begin with, International Relations, if you talk about this discipline, we must talk about Political Science. And Aristotle, the father of political science, once said that man by nature and necessity is a social animal. There are two components, nature and necessity. It means that the nature of human being as well as the desires both compel human being to be a social animal. In modern times also, it can be said that no nation or country can live in isolation. That means we have to learn the lesson of coexistence. We have to coexist with each other. So the coexistence of nations and cordial relations among them have become important phenomena in the modern life. International relations thus has assumed great pragmatic and academic significance in the present times. Now, we should also discuss about the emergence of international relations as an academic discipline. If you talk about the emergence, then one important event can be considered as a milestone and that is the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. 1648 is a very important year in the history of international relations because with the Treaty of Westphalia, there was the end of 30 years of war in Europe. And this war came to an end with the recognition of nation states. Previously, this concept was missing. With this, the principle of non-interference, sovereignty and balance of power also came into existence. Now, with this territorial sovereignty, nation states all became the basic unit of international relations. After this, in 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht got signed. It was the second important event in the evolution of the international relations. This treaty once again emphasized that the ultimate authority is within the territory's sovereign borders and there is no superior external authority. With this, international relations as a distinct field started evolving. But the first IR professorship with the Woodrow Wilson Chair at Eberstewith University of Wales in 1919 marked international relations as a distinct field of academic discipline. Now, after this, in 1920s, in the Department of International Relations at London School of Economics and Political Science, this department was formed and very soon some other universities also started adopting this phenomena. In USA, in Geneva, in Switzerland, everywhere the Department of International Relations began to emerge. The creation of post of Montague Burton 
professor of international relations at the London School of Economics and Oxford gave momentum to the development of international relations as an academic discipline. Now this was the history of evolution of international relations. We should also focus on the principles of international relations. So till now if you talk particularly about India or other South Asian nations or other developing nations, international relations is still considered as a part of political science. If you talk particularly about the principles of international relations, this field international relations is exceptionally in depth in its own right. As our global society is evolving and expanding, international relations is also evolving and expanding and it is exploring new and exciting ways to link our complex world. Traditionally international relations was related to international peace, prosperity, uh, international diplomacy, arms control, alliance politics but now with the change in the global scenario there is shift towards international political economics, environmental politics, refugees, migration, human rights, um, very recently the problem of pandemics, all these are getting into the field of international relations. Now to talk about the stages of evolution of international relations, as I already mentioned that from 1648 the field of international relations as a separate academic discipline begin to evolve. So we can trace the first phase of international relations from 1648 till first world war and this phase was known as the Westphalian world order. The second phase was the interwar period that is the period between the first world war and second world war. The third phase was the phase of cold war, fourth phase was the end of the cold war and after the end of the cold war this present scenario is known as the fifth phase of international relations which is, is still going on. To look into the depth the first phase from 1648 till first world war is known as the Westphalian world order that I have already mentioned. Now during this period international politics was essentially regional politics because the politics was focused on Europe, the rest of the world was the colony of the European countries. So all politics was between the European nations. This is characterized as billiards ball model and this concept was given by Arnold Wolfers. He termed billiards ball because in the game of billiards if you kick on one ball it will disturb the whole board and every ball will get, get affected because of that push. The USA was following the doctrine of isolation, Monroe doctrine. So USA was not actively involved in the world politics, there was no superpower, four or five great powers were having the power and there was the international politics was basically focused on them. So because of the absence of universal actor, each country was getting into the fight with other and everybody was dependent on it itself because so each country will have to depend on itself for its survival. Hence nations will go for survival, for survival they go for internal and external balancing to maintain the balance of power because if there is more power vis-a-vis -vis others then it disturbed the balance of power. So nations were 
constantly colliding with each other and everybody was in the game of billiards. This model also shows that there is no permanent friend and no permanent enemy. Now the second phase and that is the interwar period. In 1914 when the first world war began, the, there was this all the European nations were colliding with each other. Now the first world war caused massive destruction and there was unparalleled devastation in almost every country that was involved whether in the form of an independent nation or as a form of the colony. So this world war gave a kind of traumatic experience because war is never good for anyone whether for victors or for losers. So this traumatic experience caused the leaders and academicians to study IR as a separate discipline because it is IR that within this discipline that this kind of phenomena can be studied. So attempts were made to change this politics and how the politics is getting conducted among states that is in the form of billiards ball. To stop this collision, to stop this fight, League of Nations was established. It was the idea of USA and with the League of Nations, the concept of collective security flourished with the principle that one for all and all for one. If there will be attack on any one nation, it will be considered as an attack on all the nations and they will come together to fight that power who is disturbing this whole thing. But as I already mentioned that the concept of League of Nations was put forward by USA, but, but USA itself could not join the League of Nations because of the opposition from US Congress. Britain and France were continued with their old politics. What was that old politics? The policy of protect, protectionism, arms race, alliances, counter alliances and these alliances, counter alliances, arms race, protectionism gave rise to second world war. With the second world war, the League of Nations failed because the main purpose for which League of Nations was formed was to avoid any kind of war, but League of Nations could not do so. Now in 1945, with the end of the second world war, when the whole world felt the heat, the whole world suffered because of that war, it was felt that now no more war and with this the third phase of international relations began and that is known as the phase of cold war. Now as the cold war began, it saw the rise of superpowers, the status of other states were reduced to satellites. There was two poles, USA and USSR, capitalism and communism. So there was the collapse of traditional balance of power that was witnessed during the first and the second phase. And this gave rise to nuclear deterrence. So nuclear balance of power started to rise to avoid the war. So now with the end of the second world war, international politics truly became international because the process of decolonization also began with the end of the second world war. 
during that time that is after the end of the second world war many scholarly works were also done among these the work of hans morgenthau that is politics among nations the struggle for power and peace became very popular in this book he mentioned that the core of international relations to be international politics and the subject matter of international politics to be a struggle for power among sovereign nations hans morgenthau used the word international politics then charles schechler his work introduction to international relations in 1955 he emphasized all inter state relations are included in international politics although or inter state relations are not political there can be other form of relation also that is the, that need not to be exclusively political in nature then palmer and perkins international relations the world community in transition in 1969 he emphasized that international relations is related not just politics of the international community on this diplomacy and relation among states and other political units it means the totality of the relations among peoples and groups in world society now talking about the fourth phase that is the end of the cold war as we all know that during the time of the cold war the whole politics of the world was focused on usa and ussr they were only two major actors the world was bipolar every thing was revolving around them there was no significance of other nations although in indian leadership non alignment movement also started but that non alignment movement was not liked by usa and ussr in the fourth phase that is the end of the cold war there was this integration of ussr and the beginning of unipolarity with the disintegration of ussr the cold war ended and the then us president h w bush declared new world order now the global world order denotes interdependence in the views of bellish and smith he said we have moved away from state centric geopolitics to geocentric global politics the world looks like a multiplex territories started becoming irrelevant those territories those concept of sovereignty they were becoming irrelevant and international politics was going interdependent or they were overlapping so the concept of billiards ball it got replaced by the cob web model cob web model represents the multiple entry and multiple exit there was no single actor that means that as the importance of usa the importance of other states the importance of united nation everything is important it is not just one particular agency or one particular actor or one particular organization that is important and with this the next phase of international relations begin so john burton gave the concept of cobweb model in the place of billiards ball model 
international relations was also becoming society centric. Now, this curve wave model represent interdependence. Today, societies are becoming interdependent. The concept of interconnectedness is becoming too much in vogue. Globalization is there. The globalization makes boundaries irrelevant. There is the spur of technology, communication, even culture across nations are moving at a very fast rate. Their pace is very strong. So, states are becoming porous. Their surveillance capacity has declined. The traditional concept of security is getting replaced to non-traditional concept of security. As states are becoming irrelevant, so the concept of this, the uh, concept of non-state actors is getting prevalent. Thus, the concept of security is also getting widened. Now, it is not enough just to protect the national borders because this non-traditional concept of security is everywhere. Human security is important, food security is important, water security is important. So, it is not just the border security that is important. Now, with the 9-11, 9-11 can be considered as a very important event in the history of international relations because when the cold war ended and there was the beginning of new world order as uh, Bush uh, said that now there is a beginning of new world order. It was being accepted, this concept was accepted even by the non-western countries, although this concept is given by USA western country. But even non-western countries also accepted that yes, now there is new world order, new things are there. The concept of liberalization, privatization and globalization became important. And with this liberalization, privatization and globalization, the interconnectedness between nations increased. But with 9-11s, things started changing. The USA which claimed that now there is new world order, now the world is unipolar, now it is USA that is going to be the world's policeman that is going to see the law and order, that is going to protect the democracy, that is the flag bearer of human rights. All this concept got a setback with 9-11 because the world that was taking USA in the terms that USA is invincible. Nobody can replace, nobody can challenge USA, nobody can replace USA that USA got a major challenge by a non-state actor, by a group of terrorists. And 9-11 took the world order to a new turn. Things started changing, perspectives started changing. USA got a major jolt in the year 2008 with the financial crisis. The year 2008 brought a new change in the world politics because it witnessed the decline of liberal world order. That world order which was liberal in nature and who told that it is liberal in nature? West. That got a shook in the year 2008 and countries started returning to the old style. What was that? 
that was state centric geopolitics okay other things are important but state is also important so the first priority of every nation should be the protection of its borders until and unless you are not able to protect your border you are not able to protect your sovereignty you have no right to claim yourself to be the global policeman now joseph nye termed this world order as the 3d chess board the world was unipolar in militaristic sense militarily us was very powerful still after 9/11 but in economic sense in from the year 2008 the world was becoming multipolar there was the rise of china there was the rise of india brick nations all these were rising they were challenging unipolarity of usa so there was no pole rather there was diffusion of socio cultural power among numerous organizations groups etc there was the spur of regional organizations along with the global organization so now as we are entering the third decade of 21st century a multipolar world awaits us what does that mean that mean that developing countries such as india brazil indonesia they are claiming that world is no more unipolar china is challenging the unipolarity of usa so along with usa although usa is claiming itself to be the most strong but it has included china in the global politics in which form in the form of g2 group 2 usa and china it has started accepting the rise of china the year 2020 or rather i can say with the end of the year 2019 and the year 2020 the whole world faced a new kind of challenge what was that challenge that was covid 19 the pandemic that affected every corner of the world that affected every individual international politics was not directly related to every individual but this phenomena interrelated every individual of this world and it brought a new shift in the global politics so now new world order driven by national interest reliability of partners and economic factors all these got a new shift in the form of covid 19 because covid 19 gave us one lesson and that was that nothing is sufficient even if a nation claim that it is self sufficient it has secured its borders it has given a very good life to its citizens that country also that western countries scandinavian countries they also faced the heat of covid 19 and with covid 19 the concept of gated globalization came into vogue that was coined by samir saran what was the gated globalization from the year 1990 
there was the spur of LPG, liberalization, privatization and globalization. But when COVID-19 came into the vogue, the first thing that the countries did was to close their borders, stop the international flights. So, the concept of gated globalization is that, okay, we are globalized, there will be free flow of goods and services and people, but as and when the situation requires, we will close the gate of this free flow of goods, services and people. So, now there is the concept of open borders the concept of border is getting irrelevant, the concept of sovereignty is getting irrelevant, they all again came into being. So, the security landscape will continue to drive partnership, we will be in partnership, we are not denying the partnership, but there will be no longer omnibus alliances, there will be multiple channels of communication. And this multiple channels of communication is what? That is primarily the impact of information technology. So, states have become porous, their surveillance capacity has declined, but we cannot say that now there is no more globalization or there is globalization. We are in the midway of this whole phenomena. Now, we have already seen the stages or phases of the growth of international relations. Now, coming to the level of state behavior and we will analyze the level of state behavior in four groups. First is the system level analysis, then the state level analysis, then the organizational level analysis and the local level analysis. Now, what is system level analysis? When we talk about system level analysis, we have to look at how the international system affects the behavior of nation states. As we already saw in the different phases of international relations that from the first phase till the present scenario, we saw the change in the behavior of the system. So, earlier with the concept of the Treaty of Westphalia, the whole politics was focused only on Europe that was the Eurocentric. Then USA and other actors came into that with the second phase that is the phase of the interwar period. Then after the end of the second world war till the cold war, uh, till the end of the cold war, then with the end of the cold war and then the current scenario. In every phase, we saw that there is some change in the structure and with that change in the structure, there is the change in the international system and the behavior of the nation states. So, the key variable is that the power of each state is independent of them. If we talk about the state level analysis, we can say that how the characteristics of a particular state determines its foreign policy. That means, every state is different from each other. We cannot say that everybody is same the history, the background, the culture, the society, everything is different. And 
every state behave as per their characteristics. These characteristics is based on their history, their religious temperament, their social tradition. So, it includes these all factors, includes the behavior and these all factors determine the behavior of a state and that includes the analysis of economic and geographical factor also. Then the organizational level analysis. The organizational level analysis examine how organizations within a state influence the state's foreign policy behavior. So, can we say that it is the organization not states that make decision in the foreign policy? Sometimes. And then the individual level analysis. What is the individual level analysis? The decision maker. Every individual is different. The thinking, the perspective of every individual is different. So, individual level analysis view that the leader, the person who is the president or the prime minister or the foreign uh, minister, the perspective or of that particular person, the orientation of that particular person have a large impact in determining the foreign policy of a particular nation. So, when we see that how states behave, we can say that system level, state level, organizational level as well as local level. All these four factors affect the foreign policy of a nation. Any nation foreign policy cannot be derived from these factors. No nation can make its foreign policy without analyzing these levels. So, all these four levels are important in determining the foreign policy of a particular nation. So, what we saw? We saw the emergence of international relations and its different phases. We saw that from 1648 till this 2024, how international relations has evolved with the concept of the sovereignty, then globalization, gated globalization and then this present scenario that is the 3D chess model, how international relations has evolved in the different phases and how it is struggling to become a separate discipline because they are in developing countries, it is still struggling to claim itself as a separate discipline because many universities in India also, they do not offer separate course for international relations, but international relations cannot be ignored because we are living in the phase of complex interdependence. We are interdependent, but that interdependence is complex in nature. We are very good in terms of economic relations, but we are fighting at the borders. For example, India and China, it is complex interdependence. So, we can say that international relations since the time of its evolution till now, all those factors which contributed in making 
this discipline as a separate discipline cannot be ignored. The concept of sovereignty, the concept of nation state is as important as the concept of gated globalization that was prominent during the time of COVID. And we never know, in future also, we can again go back to the concept of gated globalization. Because now we are living in the phase of new normal. So, we can't ignore that we really suffered the heat of globalization also. We enjoy being free to move from one place to another. We enjoy that there is spur in information technology. But we also suffered because of this free flow. So, if don't give discipline a recognition as a separate discipline, how can we claim to offer solution to this kind of problems? Because with the growth in the technology, new kind of problems are also emerging, which needs extra effort by the whole world to have research and development on this particular field. And it will be then only when we will recognize international relations as a separate discipline, not as a part of political science. To establish this fact, there is need of theories, because theories offer us new perspective, theories give us, give us a vision to look at the things. In the field of international relations, there are different theories, but if you if we begin with the theories, there are two prominent theories and that is idealism and realism. So, international relations since the time of its evolution, there has been a massive debate between idealism and realism. So, when we want to explain the relationship between nations of the world, we need to choose how we have to look at the things. Various theories have offered different explanation about why, how and to what extent do nations interact. Now, to begin with the theories, the most important is the idealism, idealism or idealistic approach. And to counter idealism, say that as international relations is a practical subject. So, realism offers us this perspective. So, idealism and realism are two competing traditional approaches to the study of international relations. There are other approaches also, but these two are very important because then be, they begin with the beginning of international relations. And there is competition among the two to be recognized as a sound approach to the study of international relations. Both theories, idealism and realism, advocates 
that they offer a particular view to look at the international reality. They can be adopted as a means to understand and explain all the aspects of international relations. But both of them are the classical tradition of the study of international relations. To begin with idealism, idealism in international relations. What is idealism? Idealism is what ought to be, what should be, what is the ideal way. It does not teach us to look what actually is. It teaches us to look at the things that what can be there, what should be there, how we should behave. So, idealism stands for improving the course of international relations because international, international relations is already a discipline which teaches that what actually is, what are the things, explain those things how it is there. But idealism teaches that okay things are there which are which can be good which can be bad which are not in a proper shape but should we analyze the things at it is no we should analyze the things that what can be we should set the parameter that where we have to reach so they say us to eliminate the war, to eliminate the hunger, to get out of this inequality, this tyranny, this force, suppression, all the evil things that violence, we should get out of that negativity, that negative things and we should strive to move towards positivity. And how can we move towards positivity? When we set a parameter that okay, this is the goal and there we have to go. So, to remove these evils is the objective of humankind and that is what idealism wants. So, they say that it is possible to create a world that is free from these evils. Depending upon some factors, what are those factors? They are the reason, the science, the education, think before you do, until and unless we analyze, we think, we cannot move towards positivity because negativity is everywhere, evil is everywhere. We have to remove those evils. So, idealist approach derives strength from an idea and what is that idea? That is the evolutionary progress in society and the spirit of liberal idealism. What is that liberal idealism? Until and unless we make ourselves liberal in our approach, we cannot remove the evil. So, even during the time of interwar years, when we moved towards the second phase of the evolution of international relations, Woodrow Wilson become a powerful exponent of idealism. It was the Woodrow Wilson who proposed the idea of League of Nation and the League of Nation was the epitome of idealism that okay, 
there is war nations are fighting among each other but how can we avoid that things are in bad shape but we have to make the things good so if you talk about idealism the main features of idealism are a human nature is essentially good and capable of doing good things good deeds we can't say that human is bad human is good and if human is good he or she can do good things so human welfare and advancement of civilization are the concern of everybody everybody wants the welfare of all we should move towards welfare of all good for all if human nature becomes bad that bad human behavior is the product of bad environment not the bad human nature human nature is not essentially bad if it's become bad it is because of the environment it is because of the institutions that it is becoming bad in nature so how can we reform that we can reform the human nature by changing by reforming the environment which is compelling human nature to behave in that particular way because human don't want to behave in that particular way he or she is compelled to do that so human behavior this if there is some bad instinct in human behavior that can be eliminated we can do that it is doable in nature now idealism considers war as the worst feature of relations we can have good relations we can coexist peacefully we can be good to each other but if war arises what does it do it it is the worst feature the worst thing that can be done is the war what we should do we should try to avoid that war at any cost so how can we do that we can do that by reforming the international relations how can we reform that we can reform that by having good institutions good environment and for that global effort is needed it can't be done single handedly no single person or single institution or single nation can do that it has to be a global effort this global effort can only end war end violence end tyranny from international relations for example the covid 19 was it possible that covid 19 could have been contained by one single nation or one single institution no it required global effort what we already saw the problem of terrorism is terrorism can be eliminated by one single person or one single country no it requires a global effort so international community need to work to eliminate such evil to eliminate war and to eliminate that to bring peace international institutions should be committed to preserve international peace international law international order and they should work to develop and achieve peace 
prosperity and development because until and unless we work for peace prosperity and development collectively we won't be able to achieve that so international relations not only studies that what actually the things are but it also studies that how we can develop a better world how we can coexist so being a part of political science being a offshoot of political science international relations can do these things but it needs recognition as a separate discipline so that it can offer us the solution to the problems that is coming in a new form every day because things are changing in a rapid mode and until and unless we have a good research and development in the field of international relations we won't be able to get good solution for the problems that are coming each and every day in new form in new mode in new intensity the main supporters of idealism has been mahatma gandhi bernard russell woodrow wilson aldous huxley william ladd richard cobden margaret mead and many others and they strongly oppose the realist view of international politics and what is that that we will study in the next lecture that is a struggle for power the concept of national interest so idealism work for eliminating war and all other form of evil in international relations and realism studies what are the problems and how we can live in those problems without getting affected that we will study in the next lecture thank you